to order um, on this May 26, uh, 2022 meeting of the Capitola City Council. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, if there's any attendees, um, welcome to you as well. Thank you for tuning in. Um, and I'm gonna ask Chloe to do the roll call and then uh, make a little announcement. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor Story. I'll read this and then I'll call for the roll. Um, in accordance with California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Council and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org and on the published meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on our website and on our YouTube channel. As always, the meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Wednesday at 8 a.m. and on Saturday following the first rebroadcast at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. And our technician this evening is Walter. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, okay, so Council Member Bertrand, are you present? I'm present. Thank you. Council Member Brooks. Here. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Present. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Here. And Mayor Story. And here. Thank you. And also, uh, thank you, Walter. Um, uh, for being our technician this evening. Um, and now if you'll join me um, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America States. and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll ask if there's any additions or deletions to the agenda this evening. Staff has no changes to the agenda this evening. Okay. Um, next, we um, have a presentation this evening, uh, and this is uh, a presentation uh, from the Central Coast Community Energy, and it's their annual update. And it looks like Ms. Stedman is here to give that presentation. Hello and welcome. Um, and I'll turn the Zoom floor over to you. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council members, staff. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here this evening and to have the opportunity to um, update you on everything uh, going on with Central Coast Community Energy. So um, is everyone able to see my screen? Excellent. Okay, well, uh, just to begin, I'd like to talk a little bit about community choice aggregation, um, which is the type of agency that Central Coast Community Energy is. Community choice aggregation occurs when communities, cities and counties come together and say, we would really like to have more control over our electricity. We'd like to have a vote on where it comes from, how much it costs. Um, and this is a model that was really enabled in 2002 with Assembly Bill 117. Um, after the passage of that bill, community choice aggregation agencies started forming throughout California. Uh, we are currently one of 23 such agencies in the state. So how does the community choice aggregation really work? Um, well, it's essentially a partnership between the joint powers authorities, the government agencies that are formed to serve a region um, with power and the investor owned utility that has traditionally served the area. So in our case, that would be Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, so essentially all of our customers um, in Capitola and the region are still receiving power through PG&E's poles and distribution lines. 
What Central Coast Community Energy does is go out and procure the power. And in our case, we have very ambitious goals that are set by our board of directors to procure renewable power. Um, so we purchase the power and in many cases invest in new power generation projects. And then again, that power is delivered to customers through Pacific Gas and Electric's infrastructure. Customers still receive their bill from Pacific Gas and Electric. It's just the portion of the bill that would have been your generation charges from PG&E would be replaced by the generation charges of Central Coast Community Energy. And it is worth noting that our rates uh, since we formed in 2018 have been very competitive with PG&E. Um, we have always um, represented a savings and currently that savings for residential customers is at about 20%. So this map shows all of the areas that we serve. We go from Santa Cruz County down to Santa Barbara County. We have about 430,000 customers and we are geographically the largest community choice aggregation agency in the state. A little bit about our government structure. We have three boards, a policy board, um, which is made up of uh, members of the board of supervisors, council members from the 33 cities and counties that we serve. Uh, we also have an operations board that is made up of county administrators, city managers. They also meet and where the policy board deals with the high level policy decisions like uh, power procurement agreements and budgets, the operations board is dealing really more with the day-to-day -day decisions that are necessary to keep the agency running. In addition, we have a community advisory council, which is made up of members of the community representing all sorts of stakeholders uh, from agriculture to advocates for uh, ratepayer equity to um, experts in areas such as air pollution. It's really a, a diverse board uh, made up of the diverse interests among the customers that we serve. Um, those who serve on our policy and operations board um, are appointed and rotate every two years. Um, cities that have less than 50,000 population will share a seat, which again rotates. And right now, Council Member Brooks serves on our policy board and City Manager Goldstein on our operations board. So thank you both very much for your service. Um, just a little about the agency and our accomplishments since we formed in 2018. We have throughout our service territory about an average 94% enrollment. So that means of all the businesses and residents in the communities that we serve, 94% of them have opted to enroll in um, community choice aggregation in our agency service. We do have uh, two rate plans, a standard rate plan, and then a second, which is a little more expensive, it's about a little less than an additional penny per kilowatt hour. Um, that is 3C prime. If you opt up to 3C prime, then we ensure that the power you're receiving is 100% renewable. And our enrollment in that program has increased about 40% just over the past year. We have two offices, uh, currently one in Monterey, one in San Luis Obispo, and we have 34 employees. Um, so definitely very proud to be offering new uh, job opportunities in the energy industry in our area. Um, so far, we have invested over $27 million in our energy programs. And I'll talk about that more a little bit later, but one of our missions as an agency is to reinvest uh, dollars back into the community and a lot of that work is done through our energy programs, which provide rebates and incentives for residents and businesses to electrify, electrify transportation and electrify buildings. 
Uh, the last thing I'll mention here is that we did receive an A rating from S&P, and we were the first community choice aggregation agency to receive that rating. So our goal is very clear and simple. It is to achieve 100% renewable power by 2030. This is 15 years ahead of the state's goal and the national goal is by 2050. So we are very ambitious in what we believe we can achieve, um, but we do think that it is achievable. And in fact, we have already made great progress toward that goal. Um, what this graph shows you is how we're doing in terms of those renewable energy projects that I mentioned earlier, where we are really going out and procuring new sources of power. Um, our policy board made a decision that it was no longer acceptable to use carbon credits and attributes as a way to report our percentage of renewable. Um, we don't want to be simply shuffling around the clean energy resources that are already out there. We wanna be contributing to a cleaner grid and making sure that new sources of clean energy come online. Um, so in the line chart, you'll see with the yellow line, the state's goals for procuring this power. And the green line is our agency's goals. The blue line represents where we actually are. So we still have a lot of work to do, um, but we've made a tremendous amount of progress. Um, and then just also briefly, the majority of the projects that we are, have entered into contract with are for solar. Uh, there's a small portion that's also wind and geothermal. And then lastly, I do wanna mention the investment that we've made in battery storage. Um, it's, you know, I think, Obvious to all of us that the sun doesn't shine 24 seven and the wind doesn't blow on demand. Uh, so really a challenge for the entire industry is how do you meet customers power demands during the hours of the day that renewable energy is not abundant? And the answer is really storage. It's being able to find a way to store that energy so it can be used in the evening hours, in the early morning when we still have energy demands, but again, the sun and the wind aren't uh, immediately available. Um, so we have uh, procured uh, many battery storage projects. Um, we've got 261 megawatts uh, in storage, and we're continuing to look at new technologies for storage and new storage projects to help serve our area. The city of Capitola, uh, you are just over 95, almost 96% enrollment. That's 5,790 customers, mostly residential, uh, but we do have 808 commercial customers in the city and 22 customers that have opted up to the 3C prime, the 100% renewable option. And I should mention that for the average residential customer, that added cost really comes to just about five extra dollars a month. Um, the other thing I will mention is that we have issued $23,000 in rebates to your businesses and residents for electrification programs. Um, but there are many more dollars available in those programs. So anyone who is listening tonight, who is interested in getting an electric vehicle or moving away from gas appliances to electric appliances, please check out our website, find out the programs that are available to you because there are many great opportunities. This is a list of the programs that we currently offer. And you can see on the left that the amount of dollars that we have put into these programs has increased substantially each year. This fiscal year, we have $14.1 million dedicated to funding these programs, and that represents 4% of our operating revenue. Um, Electrify Your Ride is probably our most popular a program that is for electric vehicles, but we also have programs for electric school buses, 
We have programs to electrify ag equipment. And each year we put more and more money into that program because our agricultural community is very interested in adopting sustainable practices. And that program has been um, fully reserved every year that we have offered it. Um, we also offer programs for new construction electrification. This is really targeted to affordable housing units. And just this week, I was at the groundbreaking for a new affordable housing project in Watsonville uh, that we played a, a part in funding in terms of making sure that this new structure is going to be fully served uh, by electric appliances and be equipped uh, to charge electric vehicles for the residents. So just a little bit more about Electrify Your Ride. Um, I'd like uh, people to know that there are several components to this program. So we are not only providing rebates for purchasing an electric vehicle. And by the way, those rebates vary according to your income. So uh, customers that meet income qualifications that are low income customers will receive double the rebate. So the rebates for vehicles range from $2,000 to $4,000, and they are stackable with other programs. There are other uh, funding sources available through the state, through other agencies, and we've had customers that have gone through the process of stacking rebates, which we can help you do, and have been able to receive $15,000 toward a vehicle. Um, but this applies not just to new vehicles, but also leased vehicles and also used vehicles. In addition, there are separate rebates for the purchase of a charger. And finally, we have another set of rebates through this program for electrical upgrades. So if you get an electric vehicle, you want to put a charger in your home and you find that your a panel is not upgraded to the point that could support that charger, we will help pay for the electrician and the work that needs to be done to upgrade your panel. The last thing I wanna mention is our local vendor registry. I talked about how important it is um, to make sure that our revenue is going back into the community. So we have introduced this registry. It's really for any local business, any service that we might need, be it marketing or catering or legal or anything, construction, to go and register your business. Uh, this really becomes the portal that we can go to, to connect with our local communities and to uh, enter into those relationships that will help um, support our local economy. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, I just wanna end with the various ways to uh, connect with us, be that through social media or our website and, um, Again, I just thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Do council members have any questions for Ms. Stedman? Um, seeing none, um, I would just like to uh, thank you, Ms. Stedman, for uh, bringing us that very informative uh, presentation um, about your uh, achievements this year, um, and um, and thank you for uh, putting us on the path to clean and sustainable energy, um, and congratulations on your um, um, I think um, achievements of being uh, ahead of your expected goals in that regard. And we look forward to soon hearing that we are a hundred percent sustainable energy. So uh, thank you once again. Um, and um, we appreciate you being here to, uh, um, you know, give us your updates. Great. Thank you so much for your support. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Well, let's... Um... Mayor Story? Yes, Jenny. I did just want to chime in and really acknowledge 3CE for the grant that they recently gave the Capitola for the electric street sweeper we just purchased. It was an amazing contribution to helping Capitola really reduce its greenhouse footprint and procure a, a, what we hope is a state-of-the-art street sweeper that 
will do the job of sweeping our streets and also not polluting our air. So it was a very significant grant. We really appreciate it. Yeah, th thanks for uh, bringing that up, Jenny. Uh, let's see, I, I don't see any hands up. So I'm going to uh, move us on to um, additional materials and I'll ask the clerk if we have any additional materials for this evening. Yes, Mayor Story, there was one additional material received. Um, it was a staff um, distributed presentation regarding item 8B, the community survey results item. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we'll move on to um, oral communications. This is the opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items that are not on tonight's agenda or are on the consent agenda. If you would like to uh, speak in public comments, just raise your hand in the Zoom application, or you can dial star nine. The moderator will give you um, three minutes, up to three minutes to speak. Um, uh, also, you can send an email to public comments at capitola.ca.us. Gov, G-O-V. Um, did I say that right, Larry? I'm sorry, I forgot to share the screen, but it's, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll get it going for you. Um, if I can find it. Yeah, the email is public comments at uh, ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, do we have any, I don't see any hands up in the, in the Zoom application. Um, any phone calls or emails? Mayor Story, I do not see any emails on this item and I don't see any uh, attendees. Let's see, make sure no attendees with their hands up at this time. Okay, I'm gonna, um, Move on then from public comments and go to staff and city council comments. Um, are there any staff comments this evening? I only have a brief announcement. I just want to congratulate Public Works on all the work that they've done to get the beach ready for summer. It's always a mad dash this time of year to start the work as soon as the permits allow us and try to get it done before the Memorial Day weekend hits. So I know everybody is all, and all hands on deck. Uh, I'm really proud of everybody's effort. Yeah, thank you, Jenny, for mentioning that. I, um, I have noticed the tractors out there grooming our beaches, getting ready for Memorial Day. So um, excellent job with that. Um, any other, are there council comments? I see uh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I would like to share a few words about the gun violence taking place throughout our country and a few things that I that I know. Um, what I know is this, that my daughter should not have to practice active shooter drills at the age of seven. I know that our country's teachers should not have to study escape plans and visualize how they would protect our children. I know that there are lawmakers blocking legislation that could reduce these horrible acts of violence, but won't because for some reason, 237 shootings this year in schools just isn't enough to make them realize that we have a problem. And I know that I've been blessed with access to this platform that when used to bring light, such atrocities can be scary and uncomfortable for some. But as much as we don't want to get into the dark shadows of politics and talk about the divide of our country, um, a, a divide we're seeing actually right here in our county and, and our city, I know that we must blur these lines when it comes to protecting our country's most valuable assets, our children. I know that the five of us here cannot ignite, ignite the change alone. So I, I ask our community to continue to show up for our children and to protect them. And my heart is truly with the families who over just this last month have 
lost lo loved ones from gun violence. And I'm sending my deepest condolences to the families in Texas. And I'm asking for a call to action for prevention and reform and to come together for our children. Thank you, Mayor Story. Thank you, Councilmember Brooks. Um, that was very well said and I think very timely, um, you know, in the wake of the shootings in Texas. Um, and um, but um, before I make any comments in that regard, I'm, I'm going to uh, call on Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Mayor Story. And my comments are are related to the the comments of Councilwoman Brooks. And although we hadn't uh, discussed this previously, I think this is something that's on all of our minds this evening and and in general. Um, I think I, like many others, are horrified by this sense senseless act of gun violence that we saw um, not only in Evaldi, Texas, but in the last several weeks in Buffalo and here in California in a house of worship. And like, there's there's just so many. Um, instances that we can point to that are just tragedies all around. And so my um, purpose of public, or excuse me, my comment tonight would be to ask if it's appropriate to you, Mayor Story, that uh, later tonight that we adjourn this meeting in honor of all of those who lost their lives, um, not only the 19 children in Uvalde, Texas, but all of those who have lost their lives to gun violence, if that's um, appropriate to you. Thank you. I think that's in, uh, completely appropriate, Council Member Brown. Um, and I will uh, do that um, at the end of this meeting. Um, and other other council members that would like to make comments at this time? Um, seeing none, um, I just want to express that um, I also share uh, Council Member Brooks and Council Member Brown's sentiments, um, you know, about the gun violence that we are experiencing. Thank God, unfortunately, we haven't experienced it uh, in Capitola, um, but we can't feel that we are immune. Um, and and I know that you know all parents um, worry about the simple act of of sending their children to school. Um, and as Council Member Brooks mentioned, that should not be the case. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that I think that at least the minimal things that we can do are really common sense um, gun control practices that are supported by 90% of Americans. Um, and, um, you know, um, there's actually a bill that's already passed the U.S. House of Representatives um, that go toward that effort. Um, and it is currently stalled in the Senate. So I would encourage anyone who may be tuning in or hearing this later is to contact your uh, um, senator um, and encourage them to do whatever they can uh, to get that bill passed in the Senate. Those are just some of the minimal things that we can do. Uh, I also see Council member Kaiser, or vice mayor Kaiser, excuse me, hand up um, and I'll call on her at this time. Thank you, mayor. I My comment was along the same lines as yours. I really feel for what's happening and I am really saddened by the fact that we are here and that we continue to be here in this position that we're in, especially for our younger generation. Um, and all I can say is, do do those acts email your senators vote be present speak up be a part of what's happening or else no change is going to be made and we really need to we need to be advocates um for for the future to come and that's um where i think we need to be focused on and and not politicize this but really get get things moving to a place where we can parents can feel comfortable sending their children to school so thank you so much thank you vice mayor kaiser um yes council member bertrand You're on, you're on mute, Councilmember Bertrand. 
I wasn't prepared to speak because what I wanted to propose, I think, requires some thought. But um, I'd like to share what those thoughts were with the city council. And um, so recently, President Biden uh, wrote an executive order basically setting standards for the federal uh, arms, uh, excuse me, uh, people in law enforcement, FBI, et cetera. And it sets a rather high level standard for uh, police operations in terms of gun violence and how to deal with guns and, uh, and other aspects of that issue. Um, unfortunately, this only affects the federal agencies involved. He doesn't have control over the state. He doesn't have control over uh, local operations. But it is also possible that uh, local operations could begin to follow those guidelines, even though we don't have to. And the commentary that I've heard is that it might go quite a distance to improving the situation. So I wasn't prepared to talk about it, but I too am very um, moved by the situations of the families that have lost their children. I'm very moved by the fact that communities are being just totally fragmented with sorrow and, and all sorts of other emotions that you know normal communities, any community should not feel. I can imagine it happening here in Capitola. Most of us in many respects know our neighbors, we know people who work in the city, we know families of the kids and stuff like that. And this kind of violence just perpetrates and leaves scars. And the scars are mostly felt by the children and the parents that lost their children, of course. But I think if we think about the impact of following in broad part, in the broad part of broader community, what this executive order is, we may be able to do something without leaving this to the Senate, which doesn't seem to want to move. House of Representatives have definitely moved, the Senate is not. So this is something I believe we could do. So the reason why I didn't bring it up, didn't want to bring it up yet, but I guess it's important for me to do so. I wanted to talk to the chief and to Jamie and see if this is something we could actually put in force in our community. And then that, the next thing I would like to do is for the city council to advocate to the board of supervisors that they also consider following the president's um, executive order. Obviously, it's not law in this community, but if we take that example, our sheriff has taken um, many examples in terms of community policing, and this was a federal-led effort. I think we could take the same effort here and have that impact that the executive order is going to have on the federal law enforcement agencies. So I believe this is something that needs some consideration. Um, and I wanted, like I said, to first talk to the chief and to talk to Jamie and then come back to the board here and see how we can push this further and be maybe the first city council in, in Santa Cruz to try to see if we could get the board of supervisors to uh, take this up also. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thank you, council member Bertrand. And uh, um, why don't you follow up with the city manager and the police chief. And I look forward to um, hearing about further about that uh, conversation. Yeah, I, I think there has to be community buy-in and you can't just ask, uh, order something like this. It would probably entail a change of policy and such. So uh, I don't think it's an on-off switch. I don't know if it's going to uh, be hard to uh, implement, but I think it's worth consideration. Uh, the reports that I've read indicates that on a federal level, it should have a substantial impact. Yes, certainly. Um, depending on, I, I think, the scope of what you're discussing, um, uh, and if we were to consider it, um, it would be through, um, I think, proper, you know, public notice um, and discourse. And so, uh, um, so with that, I will um, then move us to um, item seven which is the consent calendar for this evening. These items will be held with a single vote unless the council member wishes to pull one for um, uh, independent discussion. Um, does the council member wish to pull uh, any of the consent items? Uh, seeing none, 
Um, I'll entertain a motion on the consent calendar. I'll move the it. consent calendar. I oh. can second that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a motion by uh, Councilmember Bertrand, seconded by Vice Mayor Kaiser. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. And the consent calendar passes unanimously. Um, which will bring us to uh, item eight, which is our general government public hearings portion of our meeting this evening. Uh, and the first item is concerning community grant program recommendations. Uh, before I uh, start us off on this particular agenda item, um, I do want to disclose that uh, um, I am going to recuse myself from this item. Um, it's because um, you know my uh, wife works at an agency, uh, and we derive uh, she derives her income um, uh, from that employment, and that agency and the you know has been and is intended to continue to be an applicant an applicant uh, for the Capitola Community Grants funding. So on that basis, um, I'm going to recuse myself um, out of an abundance of caution. Um, and I will ask Vice Mayor Kaiser if she will uh, take over uh, at this time. Thank you, Mayor. We'll see you soon. And Larry, I think you're presenting item 8A. Thank you, Vice Mayor Kaiser. If Thank you. Give me a second, I will share my screen. Um, so my plan is I, I will give the presentation and then after I'm done, I'd like um, if uh, council members Brown and Brooks would like to uh, give their um, ideas behind this. And we also have um, Nicole Young from Optimal Solutions um, on the line if there's any questions. So just kind of a little background, the Capitola Community Grant Program is historically funded, depending on the year, up to 40 community groups and programs. Um, in 2018, the voters approved a percentage of the uh, transitory occupancy tax um, to dedicate toward early childhood and youth programs. And over the past few years, the city council has used this to fund youth pro the youth programs through the community grant program. Um, prior to just, you know, we're kind of at a, we kind of got to a certain point in this program and the, obviously like a lot of things, the, the, the pandemic stopped things, but prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Council did make some changes is that we did go to multi year grants and then we prior to that we even separated the budgeting from the allocation of the grants prior to that. Um, <clears throat> the budgeting and the actual grant awards were done at the same time and it, it was it was very difficult to do. Um, so sorry, let me get the next page. On April 14th, the city council received a report from optimal solutions consulting outlined the ways that community grant program could be modified um, to meet the city and the city council's needs. Um, the council approved council member Brown and Brooks to a subcommittee and uh, the subcommittee met multiple times to review the report and to consider its recommendations. The following are a list of the recommendations that were made from those meetings. Um, and the first one is to budget the grant program in the following amounts. This, this amount is actually was already included in the, the budget um, that was considered. Um, general fund funding of $125,000 um, and the early childhood and youth programming um, of 61,000. And this is not, does not include any of the uh, CDBG money that was, um, that was arranged for some of the uh, historical grantees. Um, in addition, a three year grant cycle to establish kind of a secure funding source for multiple years for these grantees. One of the things we've always heard is that, you know, consistency um, for, for the funding is really important for these organizations. Um, the next thing was to kind of, in, as part of the uh, report, um, was to kind of pick specific, what they call conditions for health and well being in the, the subcommittee came up with three specific ones, and that's stable and affordable shelter, um, health and wellness, and healthy environment. And the percentages next to that 
are the percentages of the total funding to go to each of these. So 50% of the $125,000, for example, would go to stable and affordable housing and shelter. And the additional one um, is to continue with the uh, fourth priority of early childhood and youth programming um, and to use the recurring TOT revenues for that purpose. The next step was to kind of create different tiers of grants. Um, operational grants that basically can be used to, to just kind of keep the doors open and you know make think make sure the overall uh, organization is functioning uh 30 percent in each priority so each each priority that we previously listed 30 percent of the funding for that would be of uh, operational grants which the subcommittee decided would be up to seven thousand five hundred dollars um kind of the things the organization must serve capital residents and just you know it can be used for administration the higher level grant the outcome between seventy five hundred and fifteen thousand dollars seventy percent of the priority funding of each priority would go to that um, these programs must directly benefit capital residents they would require a report i think the the final the, the decision was once during their grant cycle to the city council and up to 25% of that uh, funding could be used for administration. This is kind of a, the chart we came up with, just so you kind of get an idea. For $125,000 in general fund, um, $37,500 will be used for the, the operational grants, and then they're split among the three, th three um, uh, priorities and 87,000 would go to the outcome or the higher higher level grants. Um, and the same kind of percentage goes, was, was um, found out for, or decided for the ECYP as well. So kind of the next steps to consider is considering adjustments to these recommendations as well as the overall programming. Um, notice of funding availability for the grantees to create and to create an application that kind of defines the priorities and requirements so that the applicants know what the city is looking for and what what the priorities of the city are at that point um, we've talked about finding new ways to reach out to nonprofits other than you know because it, it's always difficult to figure out who's listening to what but we're going to find different different ways to do it to kind of get more more nonprofits that serve capital involved if we can um, then we review applications and make funding determinations generally the subcommittee reviews the applications and brings everything back to the council for consideration um, and in our in the history we haven't done multi-year contracts in a few years but in those contracts we do con we we've historically had performance responsibilities and available funding provisions for these multi-year contracts so make sure that some the organization doesn't it does what it's supposed to do um, general, we actually had something where they can't, if they, they became part of another organization, there'd be some steps to see if that funding would continue. And also if the funding is not available, there are, there are generally outs. If, if for whatever reason, we, the, the council doesn't have the funding next year, um, we included those in our previous contracts and we'll work that as well. But that we, we hadn't done that when, in the last couple of years when we've been doing one year or sometimes six month contracts that wasn't so necessary but we definitely feel with a three-year agreement there has to be something in there to make sure that over the three years the the, the grantees are doing what they said they were going to do um, so the recommended action um, is to approve the subcommittee recommendation changes for the program as displayed and to direct staff to issue a notice of funding availability um, we can read it, but I, I would like to give at this point, if it's okay, um, you know, Council Member Brown and Brooks to be able to kind of discuss with, with the Council of the, the reasoning for these recommendations. Thank you, Larry. Um, I, uh, I'll say a couple words on this and then, uh, turn it over to you, uh, Councilwoman Brooks. I'll say that the guidelines that were created um, we use some of the info and guidelines provided by Optimal Solutions in a way that we found to be appropriate and specific to our own city. So, for example, we took the community profile and the needs assessment that came out of that community profile to determine the, um, the three different categories 
that we would be funding the stable and affordable housing, the health and wellness and the healthy environment. These needs came directly from the community profile that was provided to us. Um, the way that we divided the types and amounts of grants, uh, the operational versus outcome and the amounts of, of funding that would go into each of those um, also came from uh, general guidelines and suggestions provided by Optimal Solutions. We tweaked them a little bit in the ways that, again, we felt would be more uh, suitable to our city specifically. Um, essentially, we've created a framework for how to determine who the grant awardees will be and how much they will be awarded. But this doesn't, this doesn't exclude any of our previous grant applicants from applying again. Um, you know, there's there's lots of ways for all of the people that have applied for community grants from us before to fit into the categories that we have now created. But this gives us a framework for determining who will be awarded uh, a grant from us and, and by how much. Um, and then finally, the, the three year cycle, I think, as was already mentioned, aligns our grant uh, funding cycle with the funding cycle of other jurisdictions, which will allow us to maximize our impact uh, throughout the county. And so I think those were kind of some of the key points that we considered as we came up with these guidelines. And, and I'll turn it over to you, uh, Councilwoman Brooks, for any additional comments or anything that I missed that you want to share as well. No, I think you did a great job, Councilmember Brown. I'm happy to answer any questions from Council, um, but I, I believe you, you, you did a good job explaining. And thank you, Larry. Thank you. So I, I'm I'm here to be able to answer any questions. And again, if there's questions related to the, the the previous report, Nicole Young from Optimal Solutions is also on the on the on the meeting. Thank you. Are there any council questions, Jacques? Do you have any questions you want cleared up? I don't have any questions, um, but if I can make a comment, um, then I'll wait until. Okay, great. Let's um, let's go to our attendees. Larry, if you can see, I do see somebody with their hand raised. Um, LS. We have LS. Great. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is Leah Samuels. I'm from the Human Care Alliance. We are a nonprofit leadership alliance. And um, I did yesterday have to go over with my six-year-old a safety plan for school shootings because they don't do those for children in kindergarten. And that was just a sad, heartbreaking conversation to have. Um, and I will say, having represented as a defense attorney and dependency attorney, some of the people who end up being perpetrators of violence that um, in a lot of these cases, these are children or teens who fell through the cracks. And it's often nonprofits that provide vital services that reach these children. And we can't measure the amount of tragedy that is reduced or avoided by the intervention of nonprofits. And I'm here to comment on the funding for nonprofits. And I wanted to first thank you for your presentation. It's very thorough and your thought. Um, for a changing course. I know at some point you thought you might have to cut this funding. I thank you for giving multiple year grants. Um, nonprofits really are part of our first responder team. Our concern is that the allocation of funding is less than in previous years, 2015-16, 277, 2019-20, 245. Um, and we do understand that there is this additional funding, this CDBG funding, but that funding is intended to help nonprofits with the increased workload that they've had. And it has to be used for specific purposes. Um, it's not meant to supplant other funding. So our concern is that there's lower funding being provided than historically, whereas inflation has significantly increased. And additionally, we're worried about smaller nonprofits. They can't comply with the additional funding. So, um, there's a smaller discretionary fund, and that means that smaller nonprofits are not going to be as competitive to thrive and give us their innovative solutions to help our community. We can't tell you if you have more money to give. We just want you to consider that when you're reviewing nonprofit performance, particularly in these multiple year contracts, you're reviewing what you're going to give in the future, that you 
have a realistic expectation that the services provided are not going to be at the same level for less money with inflation and that you just really keep that in your mind as you're looking at what's happening with these nonprofits and um, that you consider it's difficult for the nonprofits to con- to show increased productivity and that a lot of their productivity, like I said, is preventative and we just can't measure that. And I thank you for your time this evening. Great, thank you so much for your comment. Larry, do you see any emails or any other hands raised? Vice Mayor Kaiser, I do not see any emails on this item and it doesn't look like we have any more attendees with their hands raised. Okay, great. Then I think we can take it back um, for council comments. And I know Jacques has something, if you wanna start us off. Sure, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, my comment was, um, as um, our presenters sort of alluded to, um, this is a pattern, I, I think um, this was mentioned in that way, that will help us um, approach the problem of deciding who to fund. And, and there's categories, which um, I guess I look forward to a better definition of what the categories are, but um, I go back to the, uh, the Cole sisters presentation. I'll read that a little bit more carefully. So I think this will give us a, a, an approach, which I think we'll all appreciate because up to now we've sort of gone almost in a way of preference, <laughs> you know, what we felt about and there wasn't a really good way to support it. So I like this guideline. I, I did hear a little bit about in the discussion um, that we might have some flexibility and in answering to the, the person who just uh, from HCA made a comment. I, I think that we might be swayed by innovative um, uh, requests. I, I don't think that we would be immune to that. Um, I won't be on the board, I don't think, when this comes up. But you know, I think our board has been very receptive to trying to meet community needs. And when someone comes up with something that may work, which hasn't been tried before, I, I have great faith in our city council to provide that kind of exception and maybe make a role uh, just for that person or that agency. So thanks, those are my comments. I, I think it's an excellent presentation and uh, thank you for um, uh, Kristen Brown and Yvette Brooks in uh, working with the Nicole sisters and, and putting this, um, I think it's a great way to call them the Nicole sisters. I know they're not sisters, but I, I think it was great that you put together this presentation and thank you very much for serving on that committee. That's it. Great, thank you. Councilmember Brown? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, address some of the concerns that I heard from our speaker because I think that they're valid concerns and there's some that we discussed during um, our consideration of, of our funding uh, model as well. So while we have what looks like less funding this time around, in actuality, we had um, pulled our, our early childhood and, and youth programming funds that are now being funded through um, our TOT dollars. And so they're no longer considered as part of our, I guess you'd call our general community grants because they have their own dedicated funding. So there's about $60,000 just for that. There's $125,000 for this overall community grant program as you see with the three priorities in the top. And then we have that $150,000 for CDBG funding that's not COVID related. That's, a, that's something different entirely. And when you add all that together, we're actually putting more towards community programs than we ever have before in the past. And so I, I can understand why at first glance, just looking at just these three categories with their $125,000, it looks like it's less, but overall we're giving more to community programs than the city of Capitola ever has, which I'm really excited about. Um, and if I got my math wrong or my statistics wrong on any of those, I would invite uh, Larry or, or Jamie or Yvette to, to call me out. I, I'm pretty sure that that's um, the correct numbers, but um, I just wanted to address that because it is a valid concern. And I want to make sure that the community knows that these are things that we took into consideration during our deliberations of this, this new model for our grant program. Great. Thank you. I also wanted to um, add in that I am sort of looking forward to entertaining the, the three-year sort of contract idea and just I feel like it creates more of a relationship with um, 
with the nonprofit and we can kind of see progress as we go throughout the three years rather than just trying to reevaluate once once a year or, or even less than that. Um, so thank you guys for all your work on this. And um, do does anybody else need to say anything or do we want to go forward and uh, make a motion on staff recommendation? If I may, Vice Mayor. Yeah. Sure. Um, I will make a motion to approve the subcommittee recommendation changes to the community grant program as displayed and direct staff to issue a notice of available funding. Uh, I will not read the three points that have been presented, and I think those are obvious, but I'd like to make that uh, approval motion. Great. Thank you. Do we have a second? I'll go ahead and second. All right, so we have a motion by Councilmember Bertrand and a second by Councilmember Brooks. Chloe, may we please have a roll call? Yes, Councilmember Bertrand. I agree. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. And Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. Thank you. So that passes unanimously. Mayor Story had to recuse himself, but now he can come back. Welcome back. Thank you, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Were you listening, Sam? Where are you supposed to listen to you? I'll never tell. You'll never um, tell. Okay. I'm going to move us on now to uh, item 8B which is to receive the community survey results. The recommended action is to receive the report and provide direction to staff regarding potential measures to place on the November 2022 ballot. Um, can we have a staff report, please? Sure, I will kick this off and then I will be turning it over to Jim Bregman, who's our polling contractor who conducted the poll on behalf of the city. Um, you will recall that council had a meeting, I think a couple, couple meetings ago, and we determined that we were going to pull the concept in the community of a second home tax, and then also look at a potential district tax, district sales tax. So Gene has conducted that poll and he has his results and he's ready to present them this evening. So Gene, I think I'm ready to turn it over to you. Are you going to share a screen or do you need staff to do that for you? I think you're on mute. There we go. I think I need you guys to share that. Okay. Larry, do you think you can share I, will sh I can share it. Thank you. See it okay? Oh. Hi there. Um, nice to be back. Um, we conducted the survey via telephone, using landlines and cell phones, text messaging, uh, emails, uh, complete 168 interviews with people who can be defined likely to vote in this November. And what we just do today, kind of go through relatively quickly the uh, the highlights of the of the questions in the survey. And we started as we have in the other three surveys that that we've conducted for the city of Capitola. How would you rate Capitola as a place to live? And it's ridiculous. Positive. I mean that. 95, 97, 96, 95% of the people like living here. Um, there isn't much more to say than that. I mean, obviously, there's no differences in the community. Um, most everybody, at the very least, really likes it a whole lot. Um, chart two, another question we've asked in all four studies is just a general overall job rating uh, for the Capitola city government. Again, very positive. Um, this year, we have 71% giving the city government an excellent or good rating, and poor is at 4%. Remarkably consistent over these last eight years in, in all uh, four studies that we've done. Um, and, and there really isn't much more to say to that, except that um, you should be pleased with yourself. People recognize and think that you're doing a good job. Um, more specifically, we then asked him, uh, <clears throat> how good a job is the city doing managing its budget and finances? And these aren't as high, but it's still very positive. Um, it's been as high as 58% in 2014, 
but it's still at 50%, which is pretty similar to what it was two years ago, giving you an excellent or good rating. And again, the poor ratings are very low, just 7%. Most people who do not give you a positive rating give you a rating of, I don't know, um, they just aren't able to, to voice an opinion. Um, Ratings are a little more positive among the older voters, those over 65, and registered Democrats. And then the next chart is a question we've asked in three, the last three polls. How much need does the city have for more money in general? Great need, some need, a little need, or no real need. Um, again, fairly consistent. It's even just a hair higher this year on the great need and some need combined at 60% compared to just 55 and 54% uh, the last two times we asked this question. Um, but in, in all instances, uh, very few people, in this case, about one out of every 10, say that you have no need for more money. And that brings us to chart five, um, where we asked individually in a rotated or randomly uh, mixed up version uh, order of questions. Um, how serious are each of these issues or problems facing the city of Capitola? Very serious, somewhat not to or not at all. What you see in front of you on the chart are the proportions who say the problem is very serious, just the top box. The number one was need for more affordable housing. Not a big surprise at 53%. Then group down the 40% range are need to make beaches, effects of climate change, traffic congestion, and need to maintain these emergency public safety programs. Um, significantly lower and of less importance are the condition of city streets and roads, crime, and then at the bottom, the condition of the Capitola Community Center. Um, the need for more affordable housing, our top item was more important, rated more often as seri very serious by renters, those under the age of 50, uh, and anybody who's not a Republican. Uh, the, the, also interesting, the item H, the police um, and emergency public safety programs was more important to homeowners, people who don't have children in their households, and the oldest vote is those 65. And then that brought us to our first, and what this chart shows first, and. Uh, vote, uh, which we actually asked these twice. Uh, the first two sets of bars are the first time we just asked about any other additional information. And we read a paragraph that might uh, be similar to something people would see on a ballot uh, when they you know, filled out their ballots at home. I used to say when they'd go into the voting booth, but hardly anybody does that anymore. And since we all get our ballots at home, um, is a, a general second home tax. And we put the levels at uh, $6,000 per parcel, $3,000 for condominium. Condominium is other specified rates in general, raising about $2 million annually for 20 years. And as a general tax, it requires only 50%. And we start out with a 55% yes, and then we dropped the tax for anybody who hadn't said yes. We picked up another three points. We dropped the tax to 4,000 for parcel and 2,000 for condominium. Um, more support came from renters, Democrats, under 50 year olds, a sort of the same kind of same folks who think that uh, affordable housing is a very serious problem. Less often, uh, yes, vote among homeowners, Republicans, independents, and others, um, and the older, actually just over 50 years of age. The second set of times, however, is the second time we asked this question, which was after people heard some reason to support and oppose the second home tax. And here we dropped our support um, to 48% on the $6,000, $3,000 combination, or 50% with a slightly lower tax rate of four and two. Um, my sense 
is or my my assumption is that most have not thought much about uh, or you probably even heard of the second home tax and uh, reacted um, more positively to arguments against, as we'll see in a second, than, than normally we see in, in most polls, uh, which is why we've seen the drop off. Uh, and we, but before going on, we also asked one other version of this, and this we asked of everybody. If we just had a dedicated tax only for streets, roads, and affordable housing and nothing else, with a tax rate a little bit lower, 3,000 or 1,500, excuse me, or 1,500, how would you vote? And for this, we had 50% at first. And remember, this compares to the first time that we asked the general second home tax of 55 and 58. But at the end, this, this one went up at 55% after they heard for and against. Uh, with the focus on streets, roads, and affordable housing. Um, unfortunately, when you focus so narrowly, you create a measure that requires a two-thirds vote for passage, putting this far below where you could possibly get to that two-thirds. Whereas if you're hovering in that 50% or so range, you're in the bulk of general tax. Chart eight, as I mentioned, statements favoring and opposing. These are the five statements that we read to people about or that they read themselves or they did it online. And we asked them, is each one of these make you much more likely to oppose the second home tax? Somewhat more likely to oppose it doesn't make no difference to you one way or the other. Uh, these are just the proportions that are, again, the top box, the much more likely to oppose the second home tax. Um, and we have one particularly high item. Measure talks about all the good things it will do, but mostly the use of salaries and pensions for government bureaucrats. Which sort of one of your, sort of if you find the expression, sort of need anti-tax um, arguments against most anything that's a tax from, from the people who oppose any sort of tax. Um, but I think it may perhaps in the current environment and without people knowing much about it. The second home tax reacted quite positively to that argument. And the others were all around the 30% range, um, which again is also higher than that we often see in arguments against ballot measures, even most tax ballot measures for cities, counties, agencies, school districts, uh, whoever. Um, Democrats were less likely to say that each of these made them more, much more likely to oppose the tax. And then the next chart is the arguments in favor of the second home tax. And the only one that actually does better than the top score in the opposition is the, all the money will be used here in our local community. That's one we really ask in one form or another in just about every poll we've been doing for the last 30 years. And it's always first or second. I think once it was third, but that's pretty rare. Um, then they group together after that are four items related to affordable housing. The measure of low and moderate income people who work here to live near where they work. There's a severe housing shortage in our community. The measure will help prevent this, storage, this shortage from becoming even worse. Some of the money will be used to support the supply of affordable housing here in Capitola. The measure will curb the use of properties as vac vacation homes, preserving them as permanent homes for people who live and work in Capitola. And that's sort of the second group. Um, generally, Republicans reacted, reacted less positively to all of these. And uh, uh, the people under 50, particularly to those, all the items that are listed that are there in one shade of green or another, uh, were more effective with the, um, with the people who are under 50 years of age. So before we moved on from any sort of tax discussions, we said, well, let's, what about instead of a second home tax? We asked people about how would you vote on increasing the sales tax by that point from nine to nine and a half percent. First five years for streets and roads, just those. And there is a typo on this chart. Uh, the first one where it says no at 48%, it should be 15%. I just 
caught that, I apologize. Um, but yes, is only 38%. And then in a version that was strictly for streets, roads, I mean, no, that was the strict version, the general version, streets, roads, and other city services picked up only 1, 39%. Um, this was interesting and that the um, older people, like over 65 homeowners, Democrats, and to some ex slight extent, Republicans were more positive to, to the sales tax than were renters, younger people, independents, and, and um, people who lived here for less time. Uh, perhaps indicating just they, they know what a sales tax is and they live with that and they are a little more likely maybe to say that they can live with it. Whereas the younger voters are also the ones who want something done about affordable housing. And then in the next chart, we ask people about where they get their information um, about Capitola city services. Um, they were led by the Capitola SoCal Times at 56%, Friends and Neighbors 52, Sentinel website, cities printed newsletters, the Cat Recreation Catalog, community meetings, city digital newsletters, and city posts on Instagram or Facebook book were, were less. Um, my understanding too is that the City digital newsletters, I think, and Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong, is a fairly new uh, way of communicating with, uh, with voters that have to be at 20% now is actually pretty good. This, that hasn't been around like the Sentinel has been, or like our friends and neighbors. And then each of the people who said they had a, um, a you know, they used a specific source of information where I ask is, is that one very useful for you? Somewhat not, not at all useful. Um, so these are percentages based on those people who had said that they used a particular item, uh, a particular source. Uh, the most useful were community meetings with city officials, digital newsletters. Anyway, it says five of them that were in that 40 to 40% range um, and then less useful, I think. Interesting is that um, our, the source of information that was the greatest was the least useful, meaning the Santa Cruz Sentinel. And then our last um, specific question, uh, we asked people, if you wanted to learn more about city issues, which one or of these areas would you be most likely to participate in. Uh, two of them got about one out of every four voters they'd either attend an in-person or a Zoom meeting. And remember these are, you have to choose one only of these. 18% um, an email, send an email a letter, 16% YouTube or the city's website, and only 8% with watching community television. So we have one more slide, which I think is just sort of trying to summarize the, the six, seven points or so that I think are the most salient in the poll we just did. One, voters like living in Capitola, have positive attitudes towards city government, and generally believe that the city has a need for more money. The, the basics. They like what you do and you need more money. That's always a good start. Voters identify the most serious problems facing Capitola as related to affordable housing, maintaining Capitola's beaches, dealing with the effects of climate change and traffic congestion. Less likely to say there are serious problems related to community center crime and the condition of streets and roads. Um, and the fact that condition of streets and roads did not score particularly highly is, uh, I think is reflected back in the relatively low scores for when we have a ballot measure that concentrates on that. Slack majorities of voters initially support a second home tax, but support erodes after people hear reasons to oppose the second home tax. A sales tax increase is not supported at this time. Should the city decide to proceed with a second home tax ballot measure, it will only have a chance of passage if it is a general tax and not one with a narrow focus. 
And finally, before deciding whether or not to proceed with a ballot measure, the city needs to hear from various community stakeholders, stakeholders to determine if and how strong any opposition might be. I think if, if, if there is uh, a strong concerted effort in opposition, uh, that would make passage of a second home tax extremely problematic. Um, questions, comments, anything? Council members have questions for um, Mr. Bregman. Um, Council member Brown. Thank you, Mayor Story, and thank you, Mr. Bregman. I just have a question kind of out of pure curiosity. Um, you mentioned that some of our statistics, you know, they were in the uh, 50 or 60 percent of approval or satisfaction or whatever the question may have been. And you had mentioned that it was um, higher amongst those who were either younger or older or Democrat or not Republican or whatever, again, based on whichever question there was the different statistics. Do you right. think that these um, differences in the opinions that we received are because of our demographics as a city or because of the differences in who is more likely to actually respond to these polls? Well, when I'm saying that there are differences, it reflects a statistically significant difference mm -hmm. between two groups, between those under 50 and those over 50, between those 65 and older versus those under. And that, so that's not really a function necessarily of, uh, of who the population is per se, Capitola, other than that, the people in Capitola who fit into these groups, this is how they respond. That's a little different. Yeah, I guess what I'm asking, and again, this is, uh, forgive me, I'll, I'll wrap it up after this because it's mostly just a, right. a personal curiosity, right? Is are, is there any thought of or, or consideration of like, are people over 50 more likely to even respond to these polls? Are people who consider themselves Democratic or, you know, Democrats over Republicans more likely to respond to okay. such kind of calls? We, strat we stratify and necessary weight the results to make sure they're, they're in a correct proportion as we know from the voter statistics to be. That's so, right. so, for instance, yeah. right. So we, so we know that um, roughly 62% are registered Democrats, 15% are registered Republicans, and 23% are either registered with no party or minor parties. And that's what our sample is. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your work on this. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Bertrand. Um, thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed the presentation. Um, thank you. So in a sense, it sort of follows uh, Kristen's um, question, but I'd like something a little bit more pointed that might help us decide how we would go forward. So those are sort of presented, uh, present, excuse me, uh, percentages based on you know, that demographic. But what I'd like to see is a different way to present the data. So if we have thousand voters who are Democrat, um, excuse me, or the balance, you know, Republican, I, I'd like to get it based in terms of, okay, you answer that question, but there's more Democrats here. So if we put it on the ballot, it might have a better chance. Or if you broke it down into age demographics, and, you know, we had a very high percentage of older 65, which, you know, we've had some data that suggests that, then, you know, it might give you a better idea of putting on the ballot we might have a chance or not have a chance. So I don't know if that was, you know, under your um, mission, you know, to provide for us, but that would give us a better idea um, percentage wise in terms of our age demographics or party demographics, it give us a better idea of how to proceed. Okay, but two things. Um, the sample of the people who we interviewed in the study reflect the demographics of the likely voters in the election. So you are likely to have 62% Democrats. That may be more or less than what the actual total registration for the city of Capitola is, but this is who are likely to vote. Now, what you're talking about in a sense, I think, is turnout. Right. Is there something that will 
motivate people who don't normally vote in this sort of election to turn out, or on the contrary, to motivate people who are who usually vote in this kind of election to stay home. And, yeah, I'm trying to get a better sense. And that, that, that's um, that's kind of a function of uh, what happens in the other elections that are going on statewide, even and locally, um, and how what kind of campaigning goes around these measures. I mean, if there is a strong concerted effort by an independent group to support the second home tax. They do a lot of campaigning and a lot of communicating with voters. Um, that's going to spur people who support it to go out and vote. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. I, I think your last point is that we should be um, conversing with our stakeholders um, the tax right. that you know provided um, some TOT for, especially for our youth programs, was uh, the result of some compromises with some stakeholders. So mm -hmm. um, I think that was a great point to to bring up. And you did point out to the fact that, um, and I think Jamie will probably talk about this at some point when we're trying to decide. Forming a committee is going to be very important. You know, within. Um, the city and pushing forward and having a strategy and a budget to do that and all that, uh, totally important. So that's the second or third step <laughs> to make it effective. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jamie. Just before we go out to public comment, there was a few things I wanted to raise. The first one is, is I was just gonna quickly talk about kind of the parameters for those of you who haven't done this before around sort of what the city can and can't do campaigning. So until, up until the point that we put something on the ballot, city staff can work on, you know, producing and helping folks get to understand what a measure may or may not do. Once it's on the ballot, it becomes something that the city, city staff at least can't really be involved in. Um, and then the second thing I just thought would be helpful for council to hear tonight, and it was in the staff report, but just before we go to the public, that the key decision tonight, I think, is either A, um, decide that you want to hear more information about the second home tax. Uh, and I think probably between now and our next meeting, we'll be good to have a delegation of folks maybe meet with different community stakeholders about their feelings on it. Or the other option would be to make a determination tonight that we're not going to be putting something on the ballot and let this measure but this pass for this election cycle. Uh, so that's all I had. And with that, I think we can either go to more council questions or public comment. Yeah, thank you, Jamie, for that clarification. I'll call on Vice Mayor Kaiser. Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know if this question is for Jamie or Eugene, but um, looking at the, the, second the second home tax, and seeing that once pros and cons or information was brought up about it, the percentage went down for approval. But what if that was linked in with one of the main concerns, which is affordable housing within our community? And would if that was something that was linked to the tax, if that's where the tax money is going towards, is that going to show... Do we think that would show a higher rating um, of approval or is that we just have to keep it at the general tax? Does that make sense? Well, when you're talking about general tax, you don't, you don't run a campaign that says this is going to be a general tax that we're going to spend however we feel like it this week. You talk about the things the money can be used for mm -hmm. and affordable housing can be the lead on that. And actually in this sort of campaign because you're talking about a housing tax. Right. So it's, it's, um, it's not, um, we saw that it's so far away from getting to the two thirds, it's got to be general, but it's, it's general in the sense of the money goes to lots of things. And you talk about the fact that it goes to all the things that people liked in, in here. Um, and that, they traditionally like. I mean, and you won't spend a lot of time, for instance, talking about the community center. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> um, but you know, it's it's uh that's the 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 way you 
campaign on, on this kind of, uh, oftentimes on this kind of measure. Sometimes you just campaign, campaign on the fact that a city is in dire straits and they need everything everywhere, but that's not the case. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. One, other, one yeah. other item. Go ahead. I would share is, is that, you know, I think on about half of the tax measures that I've been involved with, there was no opposition. So nobody was actually submitting arguments against. Um, so you always want to test how effective opposition arguments are, people's opinions. Uh, the real goal is to come up with something that really doesn't have opposition because we're a relatively small community. I know in larger communities, that's never going to happen. Um, but unfortunately, in this case, we didn't come up with an argument that really resonated with a lot of voters and increased the support. So it probably would mean we need to fine tune the argument. But I think you're exactly correct, Vice Mayor Kaiser, that the affordable housing linkage with this, I think, is really intuitively necessary because of kind of the way it would be structured, that it really is sort of trying to make second homes less attractive in Capitola to preserve the housing um, for people who live and work here, right? Thank you. Um, Council Member Bertrand. You're on mute. Okay, there, got it. <laughs> and I think Jamie reminded me, I came up with this idea originally um, because, you know, when I was campaigning and both times I campaigned recently, um, neighbors did talk about their concern about second homes being here and vacant. And the concern was, you know, lack of revenue to the city, um, but also lack of community. I mean, there, there, there seemed to be, an undercurrent of concern. You know, it wasn't, you know, expressed much more than that. But you know, some people would actually stand in front of their house and point out, you know, depending on the neighborhood, oh, that house is vacant. That house is vacant. And you know, it was elevated to the the point of they knew which houses were vacant all the time, certainly because they lived there. So um, I do have a question for you, Eugene, um, and you know. Margot sort of got me thinking about this. Um, so how we present things is very important, but there was also an undercurrent of people who thought our, we weren't managing our budget very well. And I was wondering if you had some background information about that in our finances in general. I, mean, you know, I don't know how specific they were, but that was a large section of the pie chart. If you have something you could share, I'd appreciate that. Well, actually, um... It was a very small section of the pie chart of people who don't think you're managing the budget well. 7% give you a poor rating. That's, that's almost net, that's negligible. Okay. Um, so within your experience, but it, it, it was more than some of the others were again, great things, <laughs> great comments, you know, about the well, city and stuff. So when you come, it comes to money. Um, no, you know, most places do not get great ratings for how they're managing tax money. Um, that's why these are so, so good. That even okay. the people who don't give you such a good rating, it's mostly fair, or it's actually mostly people who don't know. That's probably true, or they can always do it better. Right, like yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you very much for giving us that um, relative perspective. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Mr. Brangman. Um, I wanted to ask a question uh, just um, about um, an alternative path to um, raising money for affordable housing. Um, are impact fees um, an avenue um, toward um, um, charging, um, you know, uh, vacant homes for their impact on uh, affordable housing in Capitola? So. The simple answer to that question is um, sort of no. <laughs> so we have an impact fee associated with new development that's an inclusionary fee, and that is for affordable housing. And that gets assessed on all developments that meet our criteria for, uh, for that inclusionary fee. And I know we just updated it, and I apologize, I cannot remember exactly the nuances. The challenge behind um, assessing an impact fee that's 
only on second homes or vacant homes, I think it would be very hard, number one, to create the nexus, because for an impact fee, there has to be a nexus right. of the amount of fee, what the impact is on the community. It's hard to argue that there's more demand for police services, for example, on a vacant home. And then in, number two is, is that the, 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 the vacant, vacant is sort of a use, if you will, and that could change at any given moment. And an impact fee is sort of intended to be kind of in perpetuity to build new roads associated with that development. So I hope that answers your question. We do have an inclusionary impact fee that helps us build affordable housing, um, but it isn't just assessed on vacant homes. Right, okay. Thank you for that uh, explanation, Jamie. Um, I'll, I'll ask if council members have any uh, further questions on the um, on Mr. Bregman's report before I go out to the public. And, um, and seeing none, I'm, I'm gonna open it up now for- I have one more question, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so, go, so ahead. This, you go know, ahead. You know, I couldn't get my hand up, but Eugene, this is a question for you. Um, um, I don't wanna make an assumption, but if you've done other um, surveys recently, you know, concerning public tax, um, what do you think the general view is right now? I don't think you've done anything on this, or maybe you have, but I'm just trying to get a sense of how you read. No, this, read I, I must admit, this, this is the first second home tax survey okay. I've done. This is a very new concept. Um, generally speaking, um, the, the little I've done that I've been doing that I've done lately uh, that's on these kind of tax things. Um, it's challenging, a little more than usual because people are so concerned about inflation. Um, you know, I, I mean, every poll you see that's the number one concern of voters throughout the country in general. I think it's so probably true in California as well, but the Cal Californians and Capitola residents are, are no different in this respect, tend to be um, very generous in their willingness to support financially the things that, uh, that their community. And so I, I wouldn't, I would say it's probably gonna be, I mean, assuming things have turned around by October when voting starts, um, it's gonna be a little more challenging than it might have been some other year, but certainly outside the realm of possibility, that's for sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna now see if members of the public would like to um, speak to the city council on this item. Uh, if you do, raise your uh, uh, hand in the Zoom application, or you can dial star nine and the moderator will give you three minutes to speak. You can also send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Um, Larry, I, I don't see any hands. Yes, Mayor Stryer, I do not see any hands, but we do have an email on this item. Okay, good. I'm going to share the screen. Yeah. It's, a, it's a short one, but I'm going to share the screen and, and share sound if that's okay. Okay. Have you taken into account universal mail in ballots in your modeling? JM. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah, I, I believe the question was going toward um, whether the, um, the survey process considers or matters the uh, form of voting um, and whether that uh, incorporates um, mail-in uh, voting. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, oh, yes, <laughs> the answer. Yeah, it did, so it does factor in the various sure. forms that um, residents may vote or voters may vote right. on, on the item, okay. Um, yeah, any other emails, Larry? Mayor Story, I do not see any other emails on this item, and it doesn't look wishing to speak. Nobody else. 
Okay, I'm going to then um, bring it back uh, for council deliberation to see if we can determine the, the will of the council. Um, is there a council member that would like to lead off on this item? Yes, council member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, so it, the numbers are close. I, you know, I think it's interesting what our our um, constituents gave feedback on. I think it's worth surveying our community and their thoughts to get it to define a clear path. Um, for me personally, just hearing the conversations today and terms um, interchanged in regards to vacant homes versus second homes. And I would really like to, um, if, if council agrees that we should survey the community and, and get some input on this when staff returns to really get a clear um, idea of really what the second, what defines the second home? Who are, who are those that would be exempt from it? Um, and I find it ironic because just in this like high level conversation where I know really nothing about what second homes are, I see our con constituents in our community asking for more affordable housing, but yet when we build ADUs to become second housing, you know, does our ADUs defined as a second house? And, you know, if we're increasing taxes, then those prices, those increase of cost goes to those that rent. And is that something that we could exempt? And so there's just a lot of moving parts that are when the, the survey results say that we want to increase afford, they want to see an increase of affordable housing, but yet, we may not be creating more affordable housing by raising the taxes on these second homes if those are rentals for our community. And so I just want to look at different ways we can explore that with the community in those conversation and who are those that are exempt, what defined second homes are. Um, when you come back, if, again, if this goes to, if council does agree to have this, um, the feedback from our community, you know, who did you, um, who did you survey? Who were you talking to out there? Um, and it looks like it won't pass with a two thirds vote, or at least it doesn't sound so, but for a general tax, if we're, if council wants to talk about it going into the general fund, I would be interested in having further conversation of how directly those funds would be used, even though it's for general tax. We know that we have in our, our, um, what is that, the UDL or not UDL, the um, retirement costs going up and all of these things that we really need funding for to be uh, to strategically plan our budget out for the next decade or so. And so um, what would that look like? Um, and fees associated, what ha how much does this cost to get on the ballot? How much does this cost to the city? Um, should we win or lose if we, we did this? So those are just my thoughts and comments. Um, but I most certainly think that it's worth taking it a little bit further to get the to get some more community and um, community partners buy in and, and thoughts on this. So thank you. Yeah, Council Member Brown. Thank you. I think uh, Councilwoman Brooks brings up some really good points that I, I agree with in terms of the need for us to consider this further. Um, I would like to hear more about the potential for a second home tax and, and what we could exempt. I haven't even considered the, um, the thought about ADUs and if that would be considered a second home or not. So I think that's a really good point. Um, as, as she also mentioned, you know, the, this being a, uh, would need to be a general tax and it looks like the higher acceptance was on the 4,000 per parcel, 2,000 for what, what did, what did you say it was condominium, I believe. Um, so I think I'd like to hear more about that as the specific option for, for considering moving forward with this as a general tax. Um, and then even if it was a general tax, I, I, Councilwoman Brooks mentioned um, potentially considering what that would go for. I would like to have further discussions, you know, at another time, clearly, um, about how this could be used to create more affordable housing. If we're going to be taxing housing, it would make sense to use it to create more housing. Um, 
But again, those are all conversations down the road, but just for the sake of comments for today, I would like to have this come back to council for further uh, consideration of placing this on the ballot and what that would look like. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thank you. Yeah, I kind of wanted to um, respond. Um, and this is just what I was under the impression. I think this has sort of morphed from vacant home to second home. So I think this sort of started out as being labeled as a vacant home, meaning homes that are inhabited, what, less than, I don't, I don't know, Jamie, was it like six months a year? Or was it six weeks a year? It was something where it was very obvious and kind of how Jacques was saying like that they are not inhabited, that they come whether it's a family or a renter, maybe once or twice a year, something like that. And that with our, you know, our housing crisis sort of where it's at, that this is looking into things like that. So I, that was the impression that I was under as far as second home, vacant home, not necessarily an ADU that's being rented or lived in by somebody on a regular basis that um, is, is using, you know, and, and paying tax dollars and things like that. So in my mind, those types of situations that they would be exempt, um, that's just where my head was going for it. Um, so I am definitely in favor of exploring it further. Um, there are other, other cities that have done it, um, have, have received a great amount of tax dollars from it, and which would I would like to see where we could put those, um, I do think we also would have to bring up <laughs> the thought of enforcement and how we would go about doing that as a city. And um, however, this could generate enough funds where it is creating a job for somebody or, or jobs, um, which is also great. So um, I would like to definitely see further um, information going forward. Um, what, what else we need to do? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, any other council members have comments? Um, so I, I, um, I just express my thoughts about um, you know this proposed um, tax. That um, you know I, I'm not opposed to trying to get more information um, and clarification about um, what exactly this measure may potentially be. Um, I think there does need to be further clarification uh, about um, whether it's a vacant home tax or a second home tax. Um, you know, the polling seems to identify it as a second home tax. Um, now, I'm not sure if there would be any difference in the results, though, if you um, clarified that it was a vacant home tax. Um, and um, and I don't know. I mean, our our surveys, our survey is our survey. Um, and I'm not sure if those numbers are going to change um, uh, as we try to um, you know, get more information uh, going into it. Um, probably as a part of this process, we should look at also um, talking to um, stakeholders and seeing what kind of opposition they may be. Um, it is sobering to me, though, that the polls show that. Um, uh, on the uh, larger amount, um, it, it had 55% approval, uh, but when there was any mention of opposition, that dropped 7% to 48% approval. And that doesn't bode well for passage. Even on the lesser amount, it went from 58% to just 50% approval. So those same kind of, I, I think, deltas, um, from before and after people hear the arguments of before and against it. And I'll just share, you know, my experience with, um, you know, I, I think with Mr. Bregman's fine work and when he's brought us results in the past, um, that generally what I've observed that there's about a 10 to 15% delta between what the polling shows in terms of approval and how, and how much it is actually a yes vote on it ultimately. Uh, many of the taxes that I've seen, and most of them uh, have just been either a TOT 
our general sales taxes. And generally the polling comes in very high in the 60, high 60 percent. Uh, and yet when the actual vote comes, they will pass somewhere in the 50s and low 50 percent. So I just, to me, that's just kind of taught me you got to discount the amount of approval. Um, and when I apply that to these particular numbers, um, I'm not encouraged about this being a successful campaign. Um, and, and, and I just also want to recognize there is, there is going to be a campaign going on in Santa Cruz um, at the same time, uh, you know, it's my understanding. And, um, um, and so that there, there will be a, a significant campaign there, um, which we could, you know, potentially learn from. Um, but those are my um, just thoughts about um, the item. Uh, I see Council Member Bertrand has his hands up. So, so I, I think Mr. Bergman did comment about why that drop after some education. Oh, you you've frozen, Council Member Bertrand. If you can hear me, why don't you try turning off your video? Okay, um, I'm going to, um, we seem to have lost, uh, this, uh, Council Member Bertrand seems to have lost his connection. So, um, I'm going to um, talk real slow and see if he comes back. Um, Mayor Story, do you want me to tell a joke? I can, if and, you want uh, me to kill some time. I'm kidding. No, okay, sorry, I had to. I know, I, I was almost uh, uh, intrigued to take you up on that offer, but I remember the last joke you told, so. <laughs> um, so, um, well, I'll see if uh, a council member has um, wants to lead us with direction to staff on this item. Yes, council member Brown. I'll um, ask my colleagues to let me know if I've um, wrapped up everything that we had mentioned, but I guess the uh, the recommendation to staff would be to bring this item back to us at a future meeting with consideration of adding this uh, to the ballot, um, including clarification on the difference between a vacant versus second home tax, uh, how much the tax would be, what kind of uh, properties would be exempt. Was that everything that we discussed? And how much, like, is this a two, is it, are we gonna go with the 4K, 2K or the 6K, 3K? And then I also heard about um, the cost to put it on the ballot and enforcement. Yes. That was, that, that was my list of the items we were gonna come back with. What was the last one, Jamie? I'm sorry, I missed it. Enforcement. Enforcement, yes. Yeah, so enforcement, uses, cost to put it on the ballot, uh, exemptions, qualifies, second versus vacant home, and then the amount. Cool. And what, what, what about um, discussing it with the stakeholders at this time? I think that that's a very good idea, and I would be happy to meet with other council members or mayor if um, anyone would like to reach out to stakeholders at this stage. I think that's highly advisable. Okay, it, it's, is it okay if we add that to the list of, of bring backs, so to speak? I think that's fine. It'd be great to have a, as long as I get some council member volunteers to help out. Um, I, I'll help out. I'll, I'll help. I'll work with Jamie on that. Um, so uh, I see that uh, uh, Councilmember Bertrand is back. Um, before okay. I go back, okay. to, uh, hold on. I mean, just we had a proposal from Councilmember Brown. Um, I, I, 
Do you want to put that in the form of a motion, Council Member Brown? Yes. Uh, is there a second? Do we, do we need a motion on this? I think this is just recommendations to, to staff. I don't think we're doing, do we, I, I'll make a motion if we need a motion. Well, um, well, I, I was wanting to see that we had at least um, um, uh, support among the other council members for the direction. I support. Uh, maybe just a straw poll. Um, so I, I see three thumbs up. So. Um, Mayor, uh, Mayor, <laughs> and so yes. Then now I'll, I'll go back to you, then Councilmember Bertrand. Okay, I I didn't know what happened. I just lost signal completely. I don't know if the whole system went down, so I didn't hear the proposal at all. And so if that could be repeated, that'd be great. Or the direction. I, I believe Christian um, Christian's trying to establish the direction. So yeah, there was. A recommendation of, of direction to staff based on everything that had been discussed essentially to bring this item back to us with further discussion of putting it on the ballot, what it would cost to put it on the ballot, how it would be worded, the amount of the tax, which uh, kind of homes would be considered, what's the difference between a second versus a vacant, um, which kind of properties would be exempted. What did I miss? Was that everything? I know there was more. I don't know. And reaching out to stakeholders. Reaching out to stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And enforcement. And enforcement. So that okay. was the direction to staff was essentially to bring it back to us with more details on those specific items um, so that we could further consider moving forward with putting this on the ballot based on the information that we, we received. Okay, I'm glad to um, follow um, Sam and help Jamie and all with uh, reach out to the stakeholders. So I totally agree with you, Kristen. We, we got to take those steps, figure out if it's even something we can do. And we're sort of slim. <laughs> I think the last comment I heard from Sam is that we're kind of slim bordering on, you know, not even close to 50, but a little bit over 50. And when people go into the ballot box, it may not show that we're actually that favorable. So, yep. Hey, it, it, it have unanimous uh, direction uh, to staff on this item. Um, so, uh, Jamie, do you feel you need anything from us at this time? Okay, sounds good. Um, I'm going to move us on to the next item then, which is... Hey, eight. thank you all very much. I appreciate oh, yeah, yeah th hey, thank you, uh, Mr. Bregman, for once again surveying the Capitola residents. And yeah, there's a lot of I think helpful and interesting information. And I think for all the staff and council members, just seeing you know the mood and opinions of Goodness. the uh, of, of residents on the functionings of the capital of city government. So thank you for that. Thank you, and Jamie knows I'm I'm available to conversations whenever he wants. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye bye. So um. I'll go on now to uh, item 8C, which is the regional housing needs allocation. Um, and the recommended action is to accept staff presentations on regional housing needs allocation and direct the mayor to send the attached comment letter to the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments Board of Directors. Can we have a staff presentation, please? Yes, Mayor and Council, I will be doing this this evening. Give me a second here. Well, it's not one up. Oh, there we go. Larry, how does that look? Looks just fine. Great. So I'm going to be um, standing in for our community development director this evening. Unfortunately, she had a pre-planned trip to Portugal. So she's on a red eye flight to Europe at this very moment. So this item is on the agenda to talk about the regional housing needs allocation process and what where we are in that process right now. Um, I think this is probably background for most of you, but uh, the housing elements have been required by the state of California since 1969, starting in around the 1990 era. Uh, the state added the RENA process, which is the Regional Housing Needs Allocation Process, which essentially ultimately results in 
specific number of units that gets assigned to every city and county in the state that they then have to accommodate within their housing element. And by accommodate, really what that means is have the zoning in place to allow it to be built. The process by which RENA numbers end up in our city, in our city is first the state assigns different regions um, overall numbers that then those regions have to divvy up between the different cities and counties in their area. And that formula that they developed has to be consistent with the state laws and regulations around how you do that. In our region, the entity that gets assigned the units and then ultimately adopts the formula is AMBAG, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments. So this is the sixth arena cycle uh, wherein the state is assigning numbers down to the local, to the COG, which is AMBAG, that's the Council of Local Governments. And this time around, uh, AMBAG was assigned 33,000 plus units. Uh, that's significantly higher than the previous cycles, mostly because of a whole raft of new state laws uh, that have established, you know, previously they'd had lower vacancy target ratios, um, also took into account overcrowded homes, uh, that if overcrowded homes, if homes were overcrowded, then that was an indication that there was a need for more housing. And then also there's another state law that pushed um, the RENA process to, to push more housing into higher income, less diverse communities. So in this last cycle, our region got 10,000 units, as I just mentioned, this time around 33,000. Capitola had 143 in 2015, and this time around it's uh, 1,336. So it's an entirely different ball game we're dealing with this time around. Um, the reason why we got so many, number one, is obviously the overall three-fold increase in the numbers that AMBAG got. Number two is Capitola has a high concentration of jobs. Um, since we have a high concentration of jobs, we were allocated, I think we have something like 5% of the total jobs in the region. So that gave us a pretty big chunk. And then the last piece, probably the most significant was what's called the AFFH units, the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Units. And those were divvied up to jurisdictions that were um, higher income and lower diversity and Capitola qualified as both higher income and lower diversity as compared to the other average units in our region. The other factor to take into account, I'll stay on that slide for a second, is that many of the large cities in our region that historically have taken many of the arena housing units um, did not qualify for AFFH units. So Salinas, Watsonville, Seaside, the cities in the valley, the Salinas Valley, like Greenfield, Soledad. So all of those, all of those cities didn't get any AFFH units. And so it was a relatively small pool of, of, of cities that got all these AFFH units. So as I talked about before, the RENA process involves the numbers coming in from the state into AMBAG, AMBAG taking public comment, talking about the methodology, producing different draft allocation formulas, ultimately voting on it, which our AMBAG board has done. And uh, they have now released their, their approved methodology for public comment and an appeal process. Once that's complete, then we will have our numbers um, for our next housing element update. I'm gonna talk briefly about an appeal, but I wanna be clear that staff does not recommend an appeal. Um, appeals, of the AMBAG formula are limited to number one, that they failed to consider information in the jurisdiction survey. Number two, that they did the math wrong, that they didn't, they didn't do the math right. They came up with a formula and they got Capitola's population wrong, or that there's been a significant and unforeseen change in circumstances. So that would be set up that, you know, when the rules were being considered, the city was in great shape and then we were hit with a tsunami. You know, so those would be the kind of reasons why you can appeal the arena allocation. The thing to keep in mind is that while it is a form of protest against the arena methodology that we may be frustrated with, the appeal goes back to the AMBAG board of directors. Um, our representative on AMBAG, Councilmember Brown, would be uh, required to recuse. 
from that item. Uh, and so it doesn't go to court. It just goes back to the AMBAG board. Uh, the AMBAG board certainly was divided on this. I think it was a you know, 13 to seven vote or something like that. Uh, but it wasn't, it was, they knew that there was pros and cons. And so for us to say that we don't like it at this stage would be pretty, um, it would not be a surprise. Over the history of AMBA, of arena appeals, there's been about 50 plus in Southern California and only two were accepted. And those were based on really the math was wrong. And in the Bay Area, there have been no successful appeals in sort of the history of this process. And then lastly, we would need to submit the appeal here uh, in just a few working days, which would be a real, real challenge. So instead, staff is recommending that we submit the attached letter basically in protest to the board. Uh, the AMBAG board. Uh, effectively, the argument in the letter is one that staff made during the RENA process, and I know uh, Council Member Brown reiterated at the AMBAG board level, is that fundamentally the process didn't take into account the size of the city. Uh, and so there was no factor that went in that looked at how much vacant land or underdeveloped land or total land area the city of Capitola had for development. So the end result, of this, these are the AFFH, these are the cities that get the AFFH units. Um, we end, are ending up with 400 AFFH units per square mile. And the next highest city is Carmel with 288. So you can see that really, they, it just never took into account land area. Um, this isn't a surprise to the AMBAG board. This was pointed out to them many times during the process, but ultimately the argument didn't win the day. So that's what the attached letter that we're recommending the mayor send to the AMBAG board include. So with that, um, I'm available to answer any questions. Other, other questions from council members? And seeing, seeing none, um, and, and uh, I just want to disclose that um, you know I had asked Jamie to put this on our agenda because we were in um, the comment period and the appeal period um, for the arena process, which uh, ended on June sixth. Um, and um, I just thought we should, as a council, um, I think affirmatively and consciously, um, you know, address whether or not we wanted to send in an appeal or comments um, and um, and I think it, it appears and I accept that you know a, an appeal would be a um, I, I think a fruitless uh, waste of time and energy uh, under the circumstances um, but um, I feel that um, you know that we should make um, our voice heard uh, about um, certain aspects of this process, um, and the uh, I, what I consider twofold, um, I, I think overly burdensome impact upon Capitola, um, and while at the same time, you know, this process, in my view, does not uh, address the our need for affordable housing, or in an effective way assures that it will be built. Um, and um, so just I wanted to share those thoughts. Um, and if there are no questions on the, um, on the presentation, I will then go out to uh, see if there's members of the public that would like to address the council on this matter. If you do, please raise your hand in the Zoom application or you can dial star nine. Um, as well, you can write an email to public comments at Capitola, um, strike that public comments at ci.capitola.ca.us. Larry, are you seeing anything come in? Or? Yeah. Mayor Story, I, I don't see any of the attendees with their hands raised and we have not received any emails on this. Okay, I'll um, I'll bring it back to the council, um, and uh, for further deliberation and possible action.
It's there. Um, yes, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I can completely understand the council as a whole's desire to want to show um, our united um, opinion about our disappointment of the number of uh, units that we've been allocated as a city. I um, respectfully do want to remind the council that I've been bringing up the fact that we were going to have a very large number of units coming our way since about September of last year. And I did make um, many of the points that are in the letter in our meetings. And I know that staff also wrote uh, similar letters um, to the AMBAG board. And so I um, appreciate that we would like to do this now as a group. Um, as mentioned, you know, there's only a couple reasons that we're legally allowed to appeal and it hasn't been successful in other cities. However, I do want to note that the state auditor uh, in April um, conducted a review of the RENA process and published their findings in a report and found that um, there are actions that need to be taken to improve this methodology and the trust in the system of how the methodology is determined, including you know, amending state laws to clarify how the Department of Housing and Community Development will determine a healthy vacancy rate, um, determining a formal process for documenting, documenting its consideration of uh, factors required by state law and its needs assessments, um, uh, historical trends to inform vacancy rates was one of them, review of the finance department's household formation rates and projections. There was, there was a whole report on it. Um, so I think that we're not just seeing this problem at the city level. I know other cities are seeing it as well. And I think that uh, clearly at the state level, there needs to be some changes and clearly the, uh, the state auditor sees that. Um, and also I think as we move forward, you know, this only happens every eight years. It used to be every 10 and, and now it's every eight. Um, but that means that in the next eight years, if we wanna see changes that go higher than just what's happening at the AMBAG level, then really what needs to happen is changes in the regulatory agencies that are of course um, managed by the legislation that determines how they're run. So I think that's something that we need to consider as we move forward is that these um, agencies are, are run through the guidelines of the legislation that's created them. And so if we as a city want to consider over the next eight years, any kind of advocacy on behalf of ourselves and other cities to ensure that these methodologies are changed, then that's something that, that we should consider. But that being said, I appreciate um, that, um, you know, we need to make comment as, as a united body. And I look forward to um, approving that as, or, or supporting that rather, uh, when it comes back to us for a vote. Yeah, well, thank you for uh, contributing that additional information, Council Member Brown. Um, and I think your points are well taken. Uh, Council Member Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Story. Um, I'm not one to wait eight years. So Council Member Brown, maybe <laughs> as I think about the, the our process here, I had the pleasure of going to Sacramento recently for the City Leader Summit and sat down with Senator Laird um, alongside Carmel by the Sea, Sand City, Scotts Valley, all of the cities who are and are uh, who are just as heavily impacted as ourselves. And I think in addition to this letter that we're sending, um, we should be working, or I, I would like for staff to work with um, the league on creating a, a letter, uh, including all of those cities that I mentioned, um, to share that we need a funding commitment from uh, for housing that matches the scale of this this new request, as well as to look at just what Council Member Brown was talking about, um, the process in and of itself. So, although uh, we, not that we can't change what AMBEG has done, but we have pass, moved past that um, that opportunity. And it's now time, I think, to bring in um, our senators here. And so I, I would like to see staff um, work with the League of Cities representative to create a letter um, in collaboration with the other cities Carmel by the Sea, Sand City, Scotts Valley, and I think there was a couple others I can't recall um, to to share our concerns. 
Yeah, uh, just as clarification, that's in addition to uh, the letter that's proposed in the packet. Yeah, I mean, we're, I, I'm, I agree, we don't need to do an appeal. Um, that, that wouldn't make sense. Um, I feel like that the letter to AMBEG might not be as effective as sending this to, to our Senator, to be honest, council member, I mean, uh, Mayor Story, that at this point, when I sat down and had a conversation with Senator Laird about this, this is something that he most certainly has the opportunity to do things. There's bills, a legislation on the table right now impacting the funding sources to support housing. Um, and those are things that he he should be aware of and that, that we're thinking about and that it really is impacting us. So um, to answer your question more directly, I think it would be more beneficial for a letter to go to our Senator rather than AMBEG. Mm -hmm. Understood. Um, and uh, Council Member Bertrand? Um, well, I like the letter that you've come up with and um, with help that was well-worded and I'm glad you brought it to uh, Council's attention. Um, you know, I know Kristen has brought it up many times. It's not something that has been lagging, but we're sort of a bit ahead because of the process, as Jamie um, detailed. Um, uh, thank you, um, Yvette Brooks, for reaching out to other uh, cities in the area when you were in Sacramento and uh, talking to Senator Laird. I, I appreciate your, your forward motion there on this issue. Um, I recently went to, and I agree, I think we should send a letter to our, our representatives with you, um, Yvette, I, I agree with that. Um, and also I went to a recent housing event and I talked to some staff people of our local representatives and brought up the issue of, you know, um, we'd like you to come to the city council and give a, a report on what you're doing in Sacramento. And, you know, I, I, I found that to be positively received and maybe uh, Sam, you know, as the official representative of the city to reach out to our local reps. And um, I know they're all too glad to come here and talk when they're in the in the area. So maybe that's a time when we could let them know we're very interested in this conversation. Um, uh, even that Brooks has already talked to Laird about it. So that might be easily uh, covered because he's all very aware of the issue in this area. So that's my comment about uh, trying to get our representatives in here. And um, thank you for bringing the, the letter up. And uh, thank you, Yvette, for reaching out to um, our representatives when you're in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, I was wondering if you had any feedback about sending this letter um, to our uh, state representatives? Um, as opposed directly to AMBAG, maybe CCing AMBAG. I think that we should keep AMBAG informed on what we right. do, but right. maybe addressing it directly to, um, as um, Council Member Brooks mentioned. I think that Council Member Brooks's point were well taken. I think that at the end of the day, the letter to AMBAG about this RENA process is unlikely to result in a change. I think it's more just officially saying that as a city council, we're very disappointed in their decision making. I think Council Member Brooks' suggestions are, and Council Member Brown's suggestions are exactly right in the longer term. This is what we would need to do, is reach out to our senators and our folks in Sacramento. Uh, that won't happen before this process is complete. It'll take time to pull something like that together. But I think moving forward in the longer term so that we're not in the same pickle eight years from now, or potentially we can get some housing, some, excuse me, funding to help deal with it between now and then. I think the letter to um, Sacramento from a consortium of Monterey Bay small cities is, is certainly a good call. Okay. Um I guess I, I just want to clarify, I, I, um, you know, we're, we're currently in the AMBAG um, comment period for this arena allocation. Um, this letter is to meant to respond and, and it very well may, may be a starting point. Um, and, um, but would maybe be a springboard to those, I think, future um, uh, 
activities and, and uh, lobbying that we would need to do longer term. Um, and um, so, um, is there? Let me. Um, is there a motion uh, to approve the letter um, as um, presented by staff, Councilmember Bertrand? No, I'll move that we present this letter to Ambag um, as presented by staff, uh, ceasing our representatives in Sacramento. And um, I don't know if we could get a joint letter, um, but um, maybe that's a little too late in this process. And they're a slightly different situation too. Okay, so we have a motion. I think the joint letter would uh, take, you know, that, that would be a longer term. Um, right, uh, right. Would, um, but is there a second to uh, Council Member Bertrand's motion? Um, hearing none, uh, the motion dies for the lack of a second. Um, and um, is there is there a follow up motion? Um, I'd like to make a motion for staff to work with our league representative on a letter to our state representatives regarding um, the arena numbers and the housing or and funding regarding a commitment to the new housing um, requirements. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second by council uh, Member Brooks and seconded by Council Member Bertrand. Um, and um, I'll call on Council Member Brown. Yeah, I just want to clarify, and maybe um, our city attorney can, can chime in because the item that we have before us is to approve this letter to AMBAG. And so, are we legally allowed to essentially vote on taking a different motion not related to our RENA all allocation with AMBAG? Or can we add that? as an amendment to the original motion to send the letter to AMBAG? You don't have to make the original motion. I mean, you, you need to notice the community to the extent that they know that if they want to talk about this topic, they can show up and talk about it. And I think that this motion is close enough to the original, what was on the agenda, that it's fine. So we're not sending the letter to AMBAG? Well, the... the the, the motion on that made by Councilmember Bertrand failed for lack of a second. So yes, that the letter to Ambag, it my interpretation is, is dead. Um, so and there's now uh, on um, I would call it an um, a alternate motion on the floor now. Okay, can I request a friendly amendment? Oh, certainly. Yes, you may. Okay, I'd like to request a friendly amendment. I wasn't going to second that motion because I am on the AMBAG Board of Directors, so I didn't necessarily, I'm the president of the Board of the Directors right now, so I wasn't necessarily sure that it would be appropriate for me to second the motion to send the letter, but seeing as how staff has sent a letter and I brought up these, these issues and now we've all discussed the importance of these issues, I do think we need to send the letter and then continue to do, as Councilwoman Brooks is suggesting, in the short term, work with our senators to get funding for the arena allocations that we've been given. And then in the long term, try to work to advocate to change the arena allocation process for the next cycle. So I do think that all three of these things are incredibly important. I just didn't know that I was gonna be the, uh, the only one outside of Mayor Story who was kind of pushing for it. So if there could be a friendly amendment to that motion, I would recommend that we continue moving forward with the letter to AMBAG if, if to do nothing more than to clarify that we have, as a body, collectively uh, agree with the things that both staff and myself have already brought forward to the board's attention. Okay, got it. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'll call on Ky uh, Vice Mayor Kaiser. Thanks. So I just wanted to clarify, we're sending the original item, the letter to AMBAG, basically because that's what's addressing the immediate situation, but then we'll be sending other letters regarding future movement with arena numbers and and allocations. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think that that's a kind of fair summary uh, of the motions that are before the council. Okay. 
So that wasn't my motion, and I appreciate um, Councilmember Brown bringing clarity to um, to this item. I I I have to apologize. I was mistaken to that with these conversations we just had that it wasn't uh, going to be effective for an, a letter to go up to AMBAG. I so I apologize because that's what I thought this I heard here this evening, um, and so what I'm hearing. Thank you to Council Member Brown for following up that there is some there that this will have an impact and that this is state making a, a stronger statement or making a statement just in general. So now that I've received that clarification, um, I would like to withdraw my motion and and um, restate one if that's if that's fine with you, Mayor Story. Um. So let me make, make, make sure I get this right. Um, I think as the maker of the motion, you could withdraw it with approval of the second uh, on, mm -hmm. on that particular motion. And that, that was seconded by council member Boutran. Um, are you willing to accept council member Brooks withdrawal of her, emotion, of her motion? Yes, I'm Mayor. Okay, so um, we have an amendment to that. Um, um, on the floor by council member brown um and um and i don't believe that that's been seconded yet um well was there a... he, i'd have to make a new motion um because the amendment was to the motion that she originally made and that's been withdrawn yes okay um so why don't we reset then and start over with council member brooks okay so once again, I think we've had a great conversation about a lot of great letters and the good we wanted to do for our, our city here. Um, the first letter that's presented today um, uh, by staff, I would like that we as a council, my motion is that we go ahead and submit that letter to Ann Bay. And in addition, I would like staff to work with the League of Cities in writing a collaborative letter with our sister cities um, regarding the arena numbers and a and the need for a funding commitment to uh, for housing that matches the scale of this new requirement, and that is my motion. Is there a second? I'll second that. Is there further uh, discussions on the motion? Seeing none, um, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. I second that. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Me. I should have said aye. <laughs> oh, I apologize. I took it that way. Thank you. No, I was, I was thinking a damn song. I second that emotion. It was driving me crazy. Oh. <laughs> Council Member Brown. Aye. <laughs> I don't know where my mind was going. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. And uh, sounds like it's getting late. So, um, yes, I'll, it's getting I'll, late. I'll, I'll move us on to the next item, um, which is um, dental insurance premium refund. Um, and um, the recommended action is to approve the proposed refund of up to five months of dental premium to city employees. Um, because of the nature of this particular action, um, I've been asked to uh, present a, a, a preface uh, to this uh, item and um, which um, goes as follows. Before the City Council this evening, as part of Agenda Item 8D, is a recommendation to refund dental insurance premium to employees. The City received a partial dental insurance refund from the City Insurance Provider for premiums paid in 2021 and 2022. Those eligible for the refund will include at-will management employees and City Council members, who have paid dental insurance premiums in 2021 and 2022. At-will management employees consist of department heads and the city manager. The dental insurance refunds 
for at will management and council members will be between $300 and $745, depending on the number of people covered by dental insurance in 2021 and 2022. And that concludes um, my um, uh, presentation of this particular item. Um, and um, I will um, then, uh, Larry, did you want to add? I, I, I have a quick staff, just kind of just a really quick staff report, if that's okay. Okay, yes, okay. please go ahead. I'll, I'll share my screen really quick. You did cover most of it, but <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, this is just a reminder, this was a, a dental insurance company um, provided premium refunds to the city in 2021-22. City staff um, pays insurance, the city does not. And because of this, the city, city staff would like to pass these this refund back on to the employees who were covered during that time. Um, the eligibility for this plan would be, you have to be currently employed as of the, the first of uh, um, May of this year. You had to pay, pay in dental insurance premiums for at least one month in 21 or 22. Um, and it'll be the bit refund will be based on what what the employee actually paid employee plus one employee plus two um, in 2021 refund because they did separate out the years and the refund the majority of it was for 21 and it, it's the number of actual months covered up to with a four month maximum in 2022 um, the, it'll be one month coverage um, the refund amounts for everybody will range between $60 and $745. Just, you know, the refund is taxable for employees. Um, the money that went out originally was not, so they will be taxed on it. And the plan would be to include it on the June 17th paycheck. Um, staff has reached out to the employee groups and there's been no um, issues with this. So the recommended action is to approve the proposed premium refund of up to five months of dental insurance premiums to city employees. And that is the end of my quick presentation and I'm willing to answer any questions. Questions from council members? Seeing none, I'm gonna see uh, if any member of the public would like to address the council on this item. If you do, please raise your hand in the uh, Zoom application or you can uh, dial star nine. The moderator will give you three minutes to speak. Um, or if you prefer, you can send an email to public comment at ci.capitola.ca.us. Mayor Story, I do not see any attendees with their hands raised and we have not received any emails on this item. Okay, I'll bring it back to council then um, um, for uh, a motion. I move, move staff's recommendation. Go, Jacques, go, do go, it. Go, go, <laughs> sorry. I move the recommended action to approve the proposed refund of up to five months of dental insurance premiums to city employees. I'll second. Okay. okay. It's a motion uh, to approve the recommendation by Council Member Bertrand, seconded by Council Member Brooks. I'll ask for a roll call vote. Council Member Bertrand. I approve. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Kaiser. Aye. And Mayor Story. Aye. And that motion passes unanimously, um, which will bring us to item nine, which is uh, adjournment. Um, and uh, I will adjourn this meeting and I wanna do so uh, in honor. Um, and, uh, and I think um, um, with our sympathies toward the victims of the May 24th, 2022 um, uh, mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas, as well as the May 14th, 2022 mass shooting in Buffalo, New York. Um, and with that, um, I adjourned um, the Capitol City Council until our next regularly scheduled meeting on June 9th, 2022, starting at seven o'clock PM. With that, thank you everyone. Thank you staff. Um, thank you council members for your good work this evening. And I'll close by saying, be kind to yourself and be kind to others.